Here we go. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles, or if you have your scripture journal that we provided for you, to Galatians. Where do you think? Chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. If you are new with us, or uh, popping in on, on things for us today, we are, uh, we've been traveling through this book of Galatians, this letter to the churches of Galatia. And right now, you might say that we are in a bit of a, a pit stop on the journey or kind of an oasis uh, in terms of uh, fueling up and looking, we're looking primarily at these, these nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. And then uh, in the next few weeks after Easter, we will, we will conclude the rest of, of the book. But when we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit, this is what we've been describing. We're saying this is what it looks like when a believer in Jesus is walking with the Spirit. And so in, the, in a way, it's, it's what's in the well that's, that's coming up in the bucket. And so here it is, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so today we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. And when you think of gentleness and you look at it in terms of the, the rest of these aspects of the, the fruit, this the idea of gentleness it really fits in quite well with the rest of this fruit platter, right? It just kind of nestled right in there uh, with, with patience and love and joy and peace. It's, a, it's not out of place. We would, we would say it just it flows right, and it, it's something that we could recognize this would be evidence of the Spirit in our lives. At the same time, there are sometimes there's misunderstandings about what this, this word or what gentleness really is about. And so a few misunderstandings. Another word that often is used to, is translated in this would be meekness, or it's, it's connected in that in other texts, meekness. Now in our, our world today, in our, our English vocabulary, when we hear meekness, we would think of something, of someone that is maybe, maybe shy, kind of quiet, not very assertive, doesn't have the, the self-confidence, kind of a, a wallflower. They're just, they're just kind of meek. Easily trampled on by others. And so we would say, okay, meekness is equivalent to weakness. But this is not the biblical concept in any way of meekness. Gentleness or meekness, this Greek word here, again, you're learning some, some Greek, is, is proutes. Proutes, and it's connected to humility, a humility in mind and heart. But it also has a, a picture of power. It's a, it's a fruit of, of power, but it's power that is under control. Okay? It's power that is under control. It's strength that is controlled. William Barclay says that it's like an animal that has been tamed and is under control. So sometimes the, the words that we use give us a, maybe a false sense of what this is. Another idea is the picture of Jesus that's often misunderstood. And so we have a, an idea of gentle Jesus, meek and mild. And so what I want you to do is just for a, a few seconds, just close your eyes and, and come up with a, a picture. Draw a picture in your mind of, of Jesus but not, not one where he is on the cross. So anything other than, than that, because that is sort of the typical this time of year, but other than that, just kind of compose a picture in your mind of Jesus. Now you might be one that's well studied in scripture You've come through maybe Sunday school or a youth group or you've gone to Bible school or you've sat in, in a church and you, you have an understanding of Jesus where maybe your picture was one where he was healing a blind man or he was calling Lazarus out from the tomb. 
Or maybe you have a picture of Jesus sitting in the boat, whether he is teaching from the shore or calming the waters. Those might be good pictures. But throughout our, our world and, and throughout centuries, there has been artwork or statues put in churches, ones that we also would recognize and see and recognize, okay, that's Jesus. But it's a, a very serene picture. It's a very calm Jesus. It's one perhaps where he is holding a lamb or a little child. And again, it's, it's not a, a bad picture. It's not a bad picture at all. But maybe it's not a full picture. G.K. Chesterton, he wrote this book, Gentle Jesus, Meek and Mild, and in it he, he compares and says all of the things that perhaps we, we think about when we think of the meekness, the gentle nature of Jesus, perhaps is not the full picture of Jesus. But at the same time, he says this, as I say, while the art may be insufficient, I'm not sure that the instinct is unsound. In any case, there is something appalling, something that makes the blood run cold in the idea of having a statue of Christ in wrath. And so you see, this is the, the picture that we would have of Jesus in, in his meekness, in his mildness. But we wouldn't necessarily want the opposite to be at the forefront. At the same time, this is not the full picture of Jesus or what meekness looks like. So I'm going to give you just a few examples of the, the kind of the paradox of Christ that we need to see. And, and I'll just explain this is that uh, I'm, I don't have time. I'm just giving these, these as examples in comparison, but I, wouldn't, I don't have time to unpack all the context. So the context is definitely important in all these, but I'm just using it for an example. So on one hand, Jesus says to Peter, feed my lambs. Another time he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He speaks about Jerusalem, and he calls out in a, a caring, a compassionate voice to Jerusalem. He says, I wish that I could gather you as, as a hen gathers her chicks underneath her wings. This, this gentle picture of, of a hen with her chicks. But then at the same time, Jesus speaks these words of, of woe and, and cursing on Bethsaida and Chorazin, saying it would be better off, you, you know, you're, Tyre and Sidon, you know, we're better off than, than you will be, you know, as far as how the destruction came upon them and just because of their lack of belief in Jesus. On one hand, he says to the little girl who had died, and he says she is just asleep, and he says in these gentle, compassionate words of Talitha Akum, little girl, wake up, gently waking her bringing her back from death. And then in another breath, he says to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders, the scribes, you hypocrites, brood of vipers, sons of hell. Next week, Russ is going to take us through Palm Sunday and Jesus coming in on a donkey in humility. But we also see in the book of Revelation where the Son of Man comes on a, on a riding a white horse, eyes of fire, sword coming from his mouth. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. I am gentle and humble in heart. And he also said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. With compassion, he healed the blind and lame in the temple right after driving out money changers and animals with a whip made of cords. The idea in Matthew 18 where Jesus is calling little children and holding little children to himself. And I kind of have this, I look at this passage and I think it's almost like going from the grandfather to the godfather. He calls the children and he says to them and the people around, unless you come as a child, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. You must receive the kingdom like a child. And then he says, 
But if anyone causes one of these little ones to sin or to stumble, it would be better off if a millstone was tired around their neck and they were thrown into the seas, like swim with the fishes. He's the lamb as the sacrifice and the lion as the resurrected king. If you think of meekness and you think of Jesus, you should have a full picture. Matthew 26, verse 53 gives, I think, one of the the best ideas of, of this word meekness, of strength and power under control. He's in the garden and he's been betrayed and he's being turned over into the hands of these sinful people that are going to crucify him. And you know, Peter gets out his sword, right? Ready to fight, chops off the high priest servant's ear. And Jesus heals his ear. And what does he say? He says, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? Everything around in that garden with Jesus, with his disciples, they're thinking, we're done. We're defeated. We are weak and we're getting overpowered by the forces of this world. And Jesus says, really? <laughs> like, do you not know what is at my disposal? All power, all authority is given to Jesus, and yet he has it under control, and he knew that in that moment and in that time, his mission was to lay down his life, and he had to do that to bring us salvation. So there is meekness, there is gentleness, and it is strength under control. But what does that mean for us? So a few things I'm going to take us through. What spirit-filled gentleness looks like for us. First of all, it's a humble response to God and to his word. That's where it begins. A humility when we come before God. This is what the Vines Bible Dictionary says. It consists not in a person's outward behavior only, nor yet in his relations to his fellow men, as little in his mere natural disposition. Rather, it is an inwrought grace of the soul, and the exercises of it are first and chiefly toward God. It is that temper of spirit in which we accept his dealings with us as good, and therefore without disputing or resisting. It is closely linked with humility and follows directly upon it. It is only the humble heart which is also the meek. And which, as such, does not fight against God and more or less struggle and contend with him. That's where gentleness begins as we hear the word of the Lord. We come to understand the character, the nature of God, and we recognize our position in this relationship. That he is God and we're not. James 1.21 says, Therefore, get rid of all the moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly, it's the same word, accept the word planted in you which can save you. So let me ask you, how are you responding to the word of God in your life right now? Are Are you in it? Are you soaking in God's word? Are you hearing his voice in it? Are you keeping in step with his spirit who speaks to us through it? Are you walking in obedience? Or are you resisting and are you, are you contending with it? Because think about it. Do you, do you think that in your fight against God that you're going to win? The invitation is to surrender in humility. Secondly, a humble reaction when mistreated. A humble reaction when mistreated. You know, there's going to be times when those that are hostile to God, they treat us unfairly. And there's times when even our brothers and sisters in the Lord treat us in a way that hurt us. What's our reaction? Is your reaction to to seek revenge, to, to defend yourself at all costs, to gather others around that will, will be on your side, to retaliate in kind. 
You know, there will be times when it will be good and right to stand for injustice. And there are other times where we, we simply have to say that we follow the example of Jesus when he endured the ultimate injustice. 1 Peter 2, 23 says, When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Spirit-filled gentleness is also a humble posture in disagreement on disputable matters. Oh. We're going to have a little fun with this one, okay? And I'm going to warn you, there's some, there's some big words coming here, okay? I think you can handle it or write them down and, and Google them. I'll explain a bit. But a humble posture in disagreement on disputable matters. And so there's some things as a, as a church... As a, as a family of what we are a part of, as, as part of our, our conference, um, that we are part of, our Mennonite Brethren Conference of Canada. And we have a confession of faith. We speak of that, and it's available. You can look. There are some things that we would say are, are closed-handed things. Okay? So these are things that we, we aren't going to budge on. They're, they're theologically uh, core beliefs that we gather around and we unify around. And so some of these things we would say would be the infallibility and the authority of God's word, the nature of God in Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that Jesus is the Son of God who took on flesh and became the sacrifice for our sins, that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, and identifying what the Bible calls sin and the penalty of sin apart from Christ. There's more, and that's not complete, but those are some things that we would say, these are, these are closed-handed things. And these are things that are important as, as fundamentals to what we do, we gather around, and that keep us unified. But then there are some things that we'd say, these are open-handed things. They're secondary things. They're not unimportant, but they shouldn't divide us. And particularly, and the core of this is what I'm getting at in terms of gentleness, when we fall short in gentleness, in dealing with each other in these things, it causes disunity. And so some of these things, these secondary things, we would say, you know, as far as your position on old earth or young earth creation accounts. From Calvinist to Armenian positions on eternal security, to complementarian or egalitarian positions on male and female leadership roles, to eschatology, these are the, the things about the end times and what's going to happen and everything that's going to take place. So you write all those big words down, you can look them all up. So there's things like that, and these are things that have been questions and discussions and books have been written saying this is the right way and this is the right interpretation and this, and this has been centuries on this. But we say these are, these are secondary things. Again, not unimportant, things that we can dialogue about, but they will not divide us. Then there's also disputable matters. And I, I wrote there in Romans 14, you can write that down and look it up, because that was a, an, an issue of the day there, as far as what they, what, what they would eat and what days they'd celebrate and all those things. And this has to do with Christian lifestyle freedoms. You know, we can go there with, you know, whether vaccines or no vaccines. Woo! I said it. <laughs> things that divide us, right? Goes to whether you, you know, say, well, we should only sing hymns or praises, how many of you have been a part of that in a church before where that was an issue? These are things that are disputable matters, and you could have a preference, or you could have this, and you can understand this as your interpretation. Beautiful passage in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. It wasn't probably beautiful as far as the, the conflict that was happening in the church. But we, you go into Philippians chapter 4, and we get to verse 4, and it says, Rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again, rejoice. And we're like, oh, that's so good. Let's crochet that on something. Look at verse 2. <laughs> verse 2 says, Paul says this. He says, I plead with you, and I plead with you. Two women, Iodia and Syntyche, 
women, he says, are, are contenders of the gospel with me, partners with me, these two women, and they got an issue. I got a conflict. We don't know what it is. But it's serious, and it's, it's causing disruption in the ministry of the gospel. And so Paul says this. He says, to, he says I plead with you, Eodia, and I plead with you, Syntyche, agree with each other in the Lord. And he actually says, there's a, a loyal yoke fellow, a guy that's going to have to come alongside and help them mediate, because this is a big deal, big issue. And so the big word picture in there is agree with each other in the Lord. Agree on the closed hand issues, the things that are, are non-negotiables, things that are essential, that bring unity. There's going to be non-essentials where we have to embrace liberty and all things charity. We love each other no matter what. Now, in our space here, in our room, we got people from all kinds of different backgrounds, different theological positions, you know, things like that. And we can say, okay, this is something that I believe, I have a conviction of, and, and it's, I'm not going to allow it to divide us, but I don't agree with Kimball or College Drive, and I just need to find a, a new place that will agree with me. And, and you're free to do that. Or you could say, let's, let's stay in relationship. Let's say, you know, we don't, we don't see eye to eye on that. Could we be gentle with each other? Humble in our conversations? Not aggressive in tone and say, well, I'm right, you're wrong. And hear me, I don't sense that from, from us here in this space. But let's continue to move towards that in our approach to one another with humility. Colossians 3.12 says this, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body, you are called to peace. And be thankful. All right, next you've got to have a humble approach in confrontation. Humble approach in confrontation. We're going to get there, but we'll speak to it here. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 says this. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person, what? Gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. So hear this clearly. We are not in any way to close our eyes to sin. But when we confront, we seek to do it gently with humility and a deep care and compassion for the person. We know that there can be a cost because, you know, in our, our culture today, it is not popular to call someone out for their sin. But we are still called to lovingly, humbly speak what is true and even know that we might lose the relationship. Finally, we are, we're called to have a humble answer to non-believers. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts, revere Christ, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. You know that you have power. You have power, and your power is in your, your testimony. It's the humility of your recognition of needing Jesus and how he saved you. That's, that's what we share when someone asks us, what, what's the hope that you have? Why do you live the way that you live? And you can say, well, this is where I was. 
I was lost. I was a sinner. I was desperate for God, and I needed his grace. And, and that's, that's a humble thing. It wasn't saying, well, I studied a lot, got all the right answers now, and this is what I discovered theologically. I can actually say eschatology now, because I heard it in church. You're saying, I was, I was lost, I was broken. I was like the, the old adage, I was a beggar that was looking for bread. And I found it in Jesus, the bread of life. This is what I, I have. This is what I've discovered. That's your answer. And it comes out of a place of gentleness and humility because that's your story. It has to be your story if you are a follower of Jesus. So we who are followers of Jesus, what do we do? Followers follow. And we need the Spirit to empower us to do that and to do this, what we've been called to do in gentleness. And so this was the attitude of Jesus which we are called to in, in, imitate. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand and our team can come up and I want to read this passage over us and then I'll pray. Familiar passage, but this would have been a something that was read in the early church, part of the creeds that they would follow hearing about Jesus. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So today, Holy Spirit, we say that we surrender to you. We ask that you would grow your fruit in our lives, that you would allow your strength and your power to be manifested in our lives through humility and gentleness. For it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.